This is The Prophecy Project. Understanding the times, the nations in military conflicts. With Bible teacher and author, Alan Bonk. Welcome to session number eight of The Prophecy Project. Last session, I covered Ezekiel chapter 17, the riddle of the great Babylonian eagles. We saw that the riddle covers Israel's future from the Babylonian captivity through the Jewish diaspora and continues to the restoration of Israel to their land. In other words, from Ezekiel's day all the way to our time right now. Two great eagles are seen. The first one is identified as Neo-Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, and comes into Israel and takes them to Babylon. The second great eagle is the destination or end destination of end-time immigration of the Jewish people. It is identical to the first eagle in definition, but we are not given the end-time name. Throughout the previous sessions, we found that there are two Babylons, one historic and the other is the daughter or the lady of kingdoms in the end times, which this sequence will, uh, when applied to this riddle, would indicate that the second great eagle is also called Babylon, and that's the proper name. All of the information given in the riddle is defined and revealed except the name of the second great eagle. This is the mystery of the riddle. But we do know that the nation will be symbolized by an eagle. When the angel of Revelation 17 shows John the great whore, in that verse, in that chapter, she is called mystery, or mystery Babylon the great. I believe that when the angel says mystery, he is keying us back to Ezekiel 17, to the mystery Babylon of that chapter, and the second great eagle that has never been revealed, meaning that these two are the same Babylon, the whore and the second great eagle. Now, before you say to yourself, he's really stretching things here, let me show you an example of this. In Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 and 4, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. This is a simple statement as to the two olive trees. It appears that John and you and me are supposed to know who the two olive trees are. We are given no explanation as to their identity there in Revelation. We won't know from Revelations alone who they are. You must study the Old Testament prophets to get the understanding. In this case, the prophet is Zechariah. In chapter 4, verses 1 through 14, Zechariah is shown a vision of heaven. He wakes up and there it is. And he sees two olive trees and he asks an angel that is showing him these things, what are these? And the angel says, you don't know? And Zechariah says, no, sir, I don't. Then the angel begins talking about other things, about Zerubbabel and things that he would do. And while these things do relate to the olive trees, it doesn't answer his question. So Zechariah asks him again. And again, the angel says, you don't know? And Zechariah says, no, sir, I don't know. And finally, the angel says, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. And it says in there that these two anointed ones are like conduits that oil come from the throne and goes out. Oil is the presence of God, the anointing of God. They are the anointed ones. So when we read Revelations, we know that the two olive trees that are are the personification of the Holy Spirit sent from God's throne to give people one last chance to receive God and repent. The two witnesses continue for 1,260 days, 42 months, or three and a half years, and then they are killed and left to, to rot in the streets of Jerusalem. While the people of the world rejoiced, they partied, they sent gifts one to another. They were pretty happy because they were tormented by these two witnesses. 
But after three and one half days, the spirit of life entered into them, and these two witnesses stood upon their feet. And they were called from heaven directly to heaven, and they lifted up, and everyone saw them leave. Needless to say, the party stopped, and it says they were terrified. To return to the riddle now, Ezekiel, this end-time Babylonian eagle, will play a major role for God's people, Israel. They will, it will be their home of choice until God begins to move in with an east wind, begins to blow without power and without a lot of people, without an army. He begins to call them home, and he crops them off out of that second great eagle. We will now look at America's symbolism because I want to start with the Capitol, the building right in the middle of America in Washington, D.C. Now, that term D.C. stands for the District of Columbia. The name Columbia is America personified as a woman. The city is the District of the Woman. You will see why more as we continue. The Capitol building is neoclassical in design, meaning revived from the Roman and Greek architecture. It is built consistent with that tradition in every respect. And since most people are not knowledgeable about that type of art, that type of building, I will give some basic instructions. I want to quote from a book called Prolegomena to the Study of Roman Art by author Otto Brindel. Prolegomena means preliminary statements, things you need to know, principles you need to know before you start studying Roman art and architecture and all these things. And the individual works. Learn this. And here's what he says. He says, The resort to allegory reflects a desire to expand the reach of art beyond the visible and the tangible reality of things to the realm of the invisible of ideas, notions, sentiments. It aims at the connotations and veiled meanings behind the obvious data of your senses. As a method of visual art, allegory has the power to express abstractions and to instruct. At the same time, it may foster a sense for the arcane, the mysterious. In, a, in either way, it appealed to the inclinations which were deeply embedded in the Roman intellect as they were of old in the Roman religion. These complexities of art, and I'm still quoting here, which turned their images into media of direct communication with the vagrant workings of the spirit. Their cryptic or effective principle, the cryptic vision, was not reserved for the allegorical embodiment of political ideology alone. What a quote. The Romans used their art as a means to communicate to the spirit realm and also as a tool to instruct the viewer on the spiritual realities of the art of the picture of reality. On the surface, the art seems to only be visually skillful. These guys were really talented guys. They sculpted things very beautifully. However, once you learn how to read the symbols and their allegories, you can learn much. Most of the symbolism on the Capitol building is done this way. Cryptic allegories are used throughout. The exterior symbols are mostly found in pediments. The triangular area over the top of a portico, the entrance or the doors. The east side of the Capitol has three porticos. Looking east, to the far left of the portico from the east uh, is the U.S. House of Representatives. And to the far right, the U.S. Senate portico. At the center is the central entrance. Also atop the dome, over the top, uh, is a statue, and we'll examine it as well. Now, there are two terms found associated to the capital symbolism that you need to know before we get started. It's one is genius. It literally means the presiding spirit. And it can be seen in the title. They can say it's the genius of. Or it can be seen as, in, as a nude youth, small nude person, <laughs> right on it. 
The other is apotheosis, which means to deify or exalt as a god. The word apotho means to rise up or to raise it, and theos means, of course, god. Before I speak to the meanings of the symbols, I will give descriptions of the book from the book, The Outdoor Sculpture of Washington, D.C., by James M. Good. He is a specialist, and these descriptions are coming from him first, and then I will comment. We will start with the center portico, which is titled The Genius of America. At the apex is armed America, accompanied by the American Eagle. She holds a spear and supports a shield inscribed USA. Beneath the shield is a pedestal bearing the wreathen inscription July 4th, 1776. And to the right of America is hope with the customary anchor. Justice stands opposite hope with a pair of scales. Now, that's his description. This is what we know that the presiding spirit, the genius of America, the presiding spirit over America, is a woman. Item two, we know that the eagle is also a presiding spirit and a symbol of America. The eagle is on the same raised platform in the center of the pediment because she is lifted up. And the third thing is that America, the woman Columbia, is lifted up and in a position of honor in the center. Now, let's go to the progress of civilization. It's on the Senate portico. James M. Good says, The central figure representing America, standing on a rock against which beat the ocean waves, she is attended by the American eagle. The sun rising at her feet symbolizes enlightenment of progress. And again, okay, this is me speaking. Again, we see that the woman America and the eagle has the two primary symbols that are seen here. She is seen as the pinnacle of civilization and the latest in the progression, the progress of civilization. And she's at the top. Civilization started in Babel and has progressed through time to our day. She is currently the hindermost, or the last in time, of the nations. The rising sun seen at her feet relates to the highest pagan deity there is, the sun, from whom all pagan doctrine and authority comes. I don't believe that the pagans ever actually worshipped the sun itself, but rather the god who looked like the sun. They call him the sun-like God. And to the Babylonians, he was Bel, B-E-L. And in the Hebrew scriptures, he is called Halel, or Lucifer. His name was Brightness, the light giver. He is the source of the enlightenment referred to in the above description. The scriptures say that to honor him, Halel, is an abomination to God. Next, apotheosis of democracy. This is at the House of Representatives portico. James M. Good says at the center of the pediment is armed peace, protecting the youthful figure of genius. Now here, this is where you see him the first time. Who nestles at her feet. Peace is wearing a long mantle beneath which she can be seen with a breastplate and coat of mail. Her left arm rests on a buckler which is supported by the altar by her side, while her right arm is extended over the head of genius. This is a way of acknowledging and saying, I am that spirit. By including the figure of genius in the pediment, the sculpture, sculptor is telling us that the woman at the center is the presiding spirit of America's democracy. The term apotheosis means to exalt as a god or to the level of the divine. This may sound absurd, but the sculptor, at the unveiling of this particular work, referred to it, the capital itself, as a temple of democracy. Next, we want to look at freedom. Located atop the capital dome, 
James M. Good says, the figure is the seated woman in flowing draperies bearing the tools of defense. In her left hand, she holds a wreath and a shield, while her right hand clutches a sheathed sword. Her clothing is gathered at the waist by a buckle inscribed U.S. The helmet is topped by an eagle's head. Freedom stands on a globe symbolic of vigilance over the world. All around the sphere is the inscription E Pluribus Unum, one out of many. Now, this woman is America. Her name is written on her buckle, U.S. She, we also find that the other symbol of America, the eagle, is depicted on her head. She is seen as being over the whole earth. Now, this is a pretty ingenious way of putting the eagle into a single statue by putting it on her head. But it is. It's there very clearly. Just like the Lady of Kingdoms, she is over the whole earth. Standing over the mingled peoples, woven together, e pluribus unum. Now, I want to go into the interior of the capital. Look at some works that are in there. The title of this work is Liberty, and is located in Statuary Hall. At the center of the group is a woman. Oh, my. She is identified as America by the attending American Eagle and the 12 stars that are on her crown. The eagle is located to her right and to her left is a broken column with a serpent coiled around it. The serpent and the column are symbolic keys to this piece. Now I want to show you something. In the book, The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop, written like in the 1800s, shows what appears to be a medallion in his book. The representation is probably an old woodcut. The stump in the center is explained as the dead stump of Nimrod, or Babylon. The serpent is named Helios, which means the sun, and represents is another symbol representing the sun god, Bel. And Bel is the scriptural one called Lucifer, Helios, is seen in pagan symbolism as the source of pagan resurrection in life. Next to the broken stump, to the right, is shown a new tree, which is the offspring of the stump, resurrection. On the other side is a cryptic symbol, which confirms the identity of the tree. And by saying a cryptic symbol means, I don't know what it means. The interpretation of the medallion is Nimrod's Babylon will die and will appear dead, but will be revived by Lucifer at some point in the future. So, back to the capital, back to this liberty. We find Helios wrapped around a broken or dead nation, the column. And the new nation, or the offspring, is revealed at the center, and the eagle at her right side confirms her identity. The interpretation of this scripture, which is in the capital, is America is the daughter of Babylon. She is symbolized by an eagle and a woman. The, symbol of, the symbolism is much too precise to be just chance. So how did the designers, the sculptors, the people who put this together know what to put in the symbols? In the next session, we'll cover this, and I'll let you know where they were getting their information. Now, I want to go to government buildings that are around Washington, D.C., but aren't actually at the Capitol. To show you that the woman is not just on the capital, but is actually the symbol that pervades the entire city, capital city. The first one is called Ars Boni, and that means the good of the state. Located on the Department of Justice building, the center of the pediment is a woman which represents the state. What state? America. The state, of course, is America. The nude youth indicates the woman is the presiding spirit. The nude youth is there, not by accident, but it's there. Columbia 
located at the Department Auditorium Center Pediment. James M. Good says, The central figure is the seated female Columbia, or America. An eagle, also symbolic of the United States, is located at her right side. A nude youth stands at her left. The rays of the sun reach up from behind her, and again, this is a spiritual statement. What he said was a spiritual statement and confirms that other pediments showing the woman, America, and the eagle. It's all coming together. It's like this all the way through. When I first walked through Washington, D.C., I felt like I was in Rome, Athens. Like I had left America and returned to some earlier age, some pagan capital somewhere else. I found little or no reference to the God of the Bible. Amazing. Our capital does not honor God at all, symbolically. I want to close this session at this point, but we'll go back inside the capital and look deeper into its symbols, and we'll look more at the cornerstone and see where all these things come from and how they directly tie to Babylon. Thank you. This was only one session of many. Be sure to continue watching the Prophecy Project series. If you would like to read more information on this subject, you can find Alan's books on Amazon.com. 